I think anybody that works as, an, as a bottom maker, be it exclusively or primarily, is going to show you this hammer. And in a lot of ways, this is the thing which leaves an indelible mark on your work, which identifies you. All right, I'm Ben from Stitch Down. We're here with London via Australia, the spokeshoe maker, Sebastian Tarek. It's tool time. Let's hear it. We want to hear about your tools, your favorites, the ones with the stories, the stuff you use the most, whatever it is. Tools are obviously essential uh, to your craft. We want to hear what you got. What do you love? What do you, what do you rely on? What do you just really give a shit about? The first tool I want to show you is a, uh, a shoemaker's rasp. I mean, it's, it's your classic handmade shoemaker's rasp. Uh, it's, it's the kind of like iconic shape and style. Um, this was made by the last handmade rasp maker in Tokyo. Um, on one of my early trips out there, I caught up with a, a shoemaking buddy, um, who was, I mean, like Tokyo is incredible for, for tool shopping, but I mean, it's pretty inaccessible in a lot of ways if you don't speak Japanese. Um, so he took me to this place and it was this tiny workshop with uh, two big cabinets as you walked in, uh, a, uh, a rice paper screen door, and then the biggest anvil you've ever seen in your life. And this guy had like a little notch in the anvil and he was just putting these blanks onto it and just tapping away all of the teeth of the rasps to the, the grit, if you like, that you want it to. So um, whenever I go back over there, I go to the famous tool store called Otani and I buy their like uh, classic, you know, rasp and I go through probably about like one of those every year or so. But this one I've had for maybe six years. It's my head, heavy tooth rasp. And to be honest, I actually don't know if I'm going to be able to replace it. You know, like it's, it's, it's incredible. It's, it's what I do all of my heel shaping with. Um, it takes off huge amounts of stock. And the thing is when you're making like fairly classical shoes, shape is paramount. You know, your ability to uh, feel last, how that works in terms of, you know, like the shape that you're going to form coming out of the back of it to make the heel, it, it, it's hugely important. So, yeah, like having a heel rasp, which you can you can feel, you know, all the way around the shoe, it's, it's you know, like it's, it's very important. So, so specifically for heels? Yeah, I think you wouldn't want to do the four part on the waist because the, 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 what I think it's called the stitch is the technical term to describe like the grit, like the depth of the teeth of it. The stitch on it is really heavy duty. So it's sharp and takes big chunks out. So even when I do like the, the sides of the heels, it's the first pass. Then you've got to go around with a finer ass, then a file, then glass, then 42 million grits of sandpaper and then you set the edges so like it's all that kind of like incremental process but this is you know the the rasp that you kind of do the first shape like you really put the architectural lines of it in place right right is that all he makes is rasps rasp files anything of that family that was it and he's gone that's it yeah like I, this i think i picked this one up on the first visit and by the time I went back next, he'd retired. I think he was in his mid seventies, and I heard that his shoulder blew out. And the guy that he'd been training up to be his apprentice basically at some point went, "Actually, this is a brutal way to make a living, uh, and I and I can't keep up with the amount of paracetamol I need at the end of the day because I've got a raging headache from just going ding 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 endlessly." So yeah, he's gone. The whole thing's gone. Man. Can you like revive it in any way? Or I mean, you're going through one a year. Like, what do you do at the end of the year? Oh, so the, the Otani rasps are made somewhere else and they're good. That's sweet. But this is my heel rasp. So uh, this I got is, it, got it. Yeah. Like, this is the one. I mean, like, I, I'm yet to experience what I understand as the joy of Logier rasps. And they're also a handmade rasp. Um, and I think I've been told that their classic shoemaking rasp is actually based on the shape and proportion of the, the Otani one. So at some point, I'll, I'll suck it up and find a, a native French speaker to help me through the whole ordering process with them. But yeah, it'll be emotional. Like by that point, this will have been, you know, fixed in my right hand for, you know, probably about like six, seven, eight years kind of thing. So yeah. 
it'll be sad to say goodbye. Man. Well, I'm glad you still have it. <laughs> Keep, you know, don't run it over with your car. No, it's, 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 it stays in a special place. I, you know, put a blanket over it at the end of every evening. Um, the next one is also from Japan. This is my, uh, Japanese straight blade knife. Um, this changed the way I work a lot. So that's the reason why I'm, you know, I'm, I feel pretty special about this. Um, for opening the channel on a, a welted shoe where it's a closed channel, which, you know, kind of like most classic West End work is, you know, it's, it's, it's a very hard cutting action. And to be frank, it was something that at one point I, I wanted to feel more confident about the consistency that I could do it with. So I thought, like, you know, given that I'd been used to using a, a knife that you cut like that, and therefore when you're cutting the channel, like on the bottom of the sole, you've got to kind of hold it like a pencil effectively. I'd seen some videos of Japanese shoemakers using this kind of knife, which is a pull knife, where it goes um, in your hand like that, and then you cut sort of, if you like, with more of a very gentle wrist action. So I thought uh, that makes sense that that would be an appropriate tool to use for that. So again, on a trip in, in Tokyo, same two buddies that took me out. I was like, I want to get one of these knives. And they took me on this like epic wild goose chase. We got into multiple cabs. We went to multiple shops. And eventually they were like, fuck it. We're going to go to the, we're going to go to, um, we're just going to go to the, the, the guy that makes it. So we went to this place, which wasn't that far. I don't know why we didn't go there to, to start with. And it's a knife shop. You know, make kitchen knives, make other specialty knives. And through these guys, he asked me a bunch of questions. Not a lot, like, but like, you know, maybe about three or four questions to work out for the purpose that I wanted it, what were the specs that he should do to it. And the only question that actually really sticks out in my mind that I remember is like, on the top, he was like, do you want this to be flat or do you want to be on an angle? I was like, what's the difference? And he's like, well, when it's in your hand, do you want your thumb to wrap around? Or do you want your thumb to be kind of flat like that? And I was like, I mean, that is some crazy level of consideration about shit that I haven't even <laughs> thought about yet. So I'm like, let's take it square. I'll figure out how to use it however you make it. Thank you. I think I think both ways, ultimately, given it was my first experience with this kind of knife, would have worked. But, I mean, the other sad thing is that that place has also since closed down. Fuck. Yeah, this was sort of like the premium knife manufacturer. I don't know if for all knives, but definitely for kind of like specialty shoe knives in Tokyo. And at some point, their um, their forge went cold. And these guys basically were like, I know we've been here for a very long time, but reigniting the forge is just going to be too much. And so they closed down. So I take very good care of this. I've since bought another shitty one to kind of like do other jobs. But this was the knife that changed um, how I thought about the process of cutting. And now I use this knife or this style of knife for most things. I used to be like a, a Tina 270 or a Tina uh, 231 kind of user, which is the, like the German ones, which are the more classical long, you hold it like this, you know, all that kind of action. And once I had one of these, I, yeah, it's sort of like it's hard to go back. To that I still use them for a few things, but yeah, this this I stopped pulling like that. And started like most of the action is like just this very small, sensitive kind of like use of the wrist kind of thing that that allows so much more of the arm to kind of like become part of the control process. And yeah, like this was a bit of a game changer for me. Can you keep it sharp? Yeah, I mean. Can I keep it sharp? Well, probably not. But I, I know the basic principle, thankfully. Right. And, um, if you can't get another one, you can keep it running, basically. Yeah. It's one of the things that's really interesting about Japanese knives is the the sort of like multifacetedness of it. So, you know, with a Japanese knife, you, you sharpen the hell out of the bevel surface and you just lightly touch the top flat surface because that's the hard feel. Um, and one of the other really crazy things is, you know, like with, um, uh, European or North American knives, 
the idea is that you'll probably have like one or two sharpening stones through the course of, of your, your career, but you'll have like a bunch of knives. And with the Japanese steel, it's the other way around. You go through tons of stones because the stones are soft, but the mm. steel is really hard. So thankfully, touch wood, this should last me for a while. So the, the next one is, um, I think anybody that works as, an, as a bottom maker, be it exclusively or primarily, is going to show you this hammer. Like I watched, um, I watched Graham Ebner's uh, uh, a talk with you and he had his version of this hammer. This, this is the hammer which is like an extension of you probably more than any other tool. I think if you work as a bottom maker, you use this for so many things. You use these for such specific things. And in a lot of ways, this is the thing which leaves an indelible mark on your work, which identifies you. You know, like um, if you see a, a fiddleback waist on a shoe, you know, so much of the labor, so much, actually so much of the creativity, which I think is what it is, comes via your pattern hammer, your French hammer, whatever, you know, you might know it as. Um, and, and mine's pretty lovely because um, when I was living in Australia the last time, um, tools were completely inaccessible. There hasn't technically been an industry in Australia, from what I was told, since the mid-70s. Um, and so, you know, as, as you know, it's commensurate, you know, there's, it's impossible to get anything because there's no industry. And um, I was getting more and more into what I was doing. And at the time, my father was a, a menswear writer. And he was on a junket to Europe to cover the menswear collections for a bunch of fashion houses, which meant that he had an introduction to do certain interviews. And one of the interviews he did was with the chief bootmaker of Hermes. Um, and my father is, uh, you know, like he's a gallivanting, garrulous, you know, he's very charming. And, and he explained to this gentleman, um, you know, like uh, my son is at the beginning of his career and he really wants me, if I can, to get him some tools because it's so inaccessible. But I have neither any idea what I'm looking for or where the hell to go and find it. So he wrote down on a piece of paper the name of, of a shop, which is still there, um, though it's moved several times, and a list of what he should go and buy. And this was one of the things that he purchased for me. No way. Uh, and, and I love it dearly. But the, the, the nicest part of that story is as my father was leaving, the gentleman in question stopped him and said, please, please, I have something I want to give your son. Now, this guy was apparently retiring after a very, very long storied career three months later. This would be like one of his last kind of like formal uh, duties. And he said, as I'm nearing the end of my career and your son is the beginning, I'd like to give him this, my pattern hammer. Uh, and so this is just this like amazing gnarls, you know, like has probably made more boots and I've had hot dinners kind of hammer. And um, uh, I've, I've, never, I've never used it to make shoes. I'm sure that the hammer would fly off and I'd have to, you know, repair this deeply, you know, broken shaft. But it's an emblem. It's this beautiful thing that's done. <laughs> Wait, so you never even used this one? No. <laughs> no. No. Like maybe one day. But um, I, I have my hammer. You have your own hammer. Yeah. Why? Yeah. yeah. This is the inspiration for, for mine. You know, okay. one day, okay. hopefully I can do the same kind of thing in, in a, you know, uh, corny fashion. Say, you know, like as we are near the beginning of your career, here, have my hammer. So, yeah. So yeah, that's that's the other hammer. That's it. Good tools, man. Uh, look, we appreciate it. Uh, go make some shoes. Cool.